Good morning, Swati Kalgankar with the Almond Board of California. Um, those were all very good talks this morning. Thank you very much, very informative. Um, I heard <clears throat> the mention of uh, germ-free models come up quite a few times this morning, and then Marge or slash Cindy also mentioned notobiotic models. Um, of course, uh, as you guys mentioned, sometimes there is really no alternative to using animal models, but within the use of those options, there is uh, some difference in opinion, um, particularly with the use of germ-free models. It is, uh, there are opinions out there that say that they do not adequately represent um, real-life scenarios in terms of humans. Um, you know, A, humans are not germ-free, and uh, B, it's said, and, and I've read some publications that talk about how these uh, animals can be metabolically challenged. And so they suggest the use of notobiotic animals, and uh, others suggest that neither strain should really be used, or neither model should really be used. So what are your thoughts on, uh, on that, on how ac adequately or accurately these represent human models? Yeah. I, I guess I can start. There we go. Uh, I can start on this. I, I mean, um, for me, the use of germ-free animals has really helped us in our strategy because it, it, it's a way that we can answer the question, is the microbiome involved, yes or no? Um, we don't use it to model human anything. The, you know, the only thing you could maybe make an allusion to is the boy in the bubble. These are mice in the bubble. But I think some of the very elegant humanization studies where humanized microbiome is put back into, the, um, into germ free animals has shown that we can actually use them very, very successfully to get in, insight into microbe host uh, interactions. So, as long as we are careful about the caveats, like every model, the best, you know. Is just that a model? The best model of a human is a human. So you know, um, but as Gary very nicely alluded in, in his slide, you know, th there are advantages to using model systems, and germ-free has really helped this field move forward an awful lot. But it has limitations, not just in terms of its metabolism, but also its immune system. Uh, and it, from my perspective, their brains develop very differently. But that in itself is, it tells me that the microbiome is involved in your developmental trajectories. They're a really good starting point. Okay. It's on the side. It's on the side. It's on the, it's here, Gary. Here. Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. So um, uh, I, I agree largely with what John has said. I mean, I, I think about this from the immune development standpoint. So it's a, they, they have a very naive immune system in a way that, that humans would never really have. Nevertheless, we do do germ-free notobiotic experiments. The way that we use those models is very precisely maybe adding one or two organisms that are genetically modified to identify a particular specific mechanism. Um, our preferred approach actually uh, is actually to reduce bacteria load of the host, of the colonized host. So um, in mice, we can reduce bacteria load by over five logs using the intervention I showed you in the farm study, and then actually transfer the microbiota to a previously colonized host that already has a mature immune system. Um, and the reason that we have some level of confidence in that is that I just showed you data that in humans we can reduce bacterial load by about the same amount by, by five logs. And we do this as physicians already when we purge the gut for various types of interventions. So I think they do have a role. There's no question about the precision which, which you can understand a biological mechanism in a germ-free notobiotic mice cannot be reproduced um, in any other model system, yet we do have to understand that germ-free mice are not humans. I agree with John on that. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, it's Keith Warren from the University of Guelph. Um, I don't think we've all, well, we couldn't help but miss the news about trilose and Clostridium difficile, how it born this uh, deadly pathogen. But do you think food additives have such a major effect on the microbiome and how we're going to deal with that? Uh, food effects on 
And can you say that again, food effects well, and the microbiome? Yeah, or? so, well, the first thing was, wasn't it, the uh, story about trailose, which is a sweetener, has, you know, was the cause of Clostridium difficile to get where it is today, which is one of the deadliest pathogens, if we believe that. But it does raise an, an issue, isn't it? Because when I see what we saw today, which are very good talks, is it's all the macro sort of nutrients, but it's these sort of additives, the, nu the other nutrients, that, and well, preservatives and things like that, which might have a bigger impact on the microbiome than we feel. Yes, I, I got it. So, That's all right. <clears throat> I was, yeah, so I can address that directly. So um, Andrew Gewertz, who published that article about dietary emulsifiers um, uh, in Nature, uh, and I have been talking for years about maybe doing something in humans because we totally respect the fact that what he studies is mice. And for all the reasons that I showed you in my talk, it's a very interesting observation. We have no idea whether or not this is relevant in humans. So we just got an NIH grant and we're about to launch a study right now where we're going to um, treat humans with, in a defined um, way in an inpatient study with dietary emulsifiers. Now, we don't think that within a two-year period of time that we're going to cause metabolic syndrome obesity in a human. But what we are looking for are specific biological features and biomarkers that we know we see in mice. We want to see if we can reproduce that in humans, right? So if we reproduce anything in humans that he actually saw in mice, that's actually very important because we now have a validated biomarker in humans that we can use to study larger human populations in terms of dietary emulsifier consumption. Alternatively, we may not be able to reproduce anything that he saw in a mouse. If we see that, that's just as important for the field, to be honest with you. So either way, as a researcher funded by NIH, it's a no, it's a, I mean, we, we'll win either way because it's important information one way or the other. Too true, thanks. Good morning. Uh, thank you for an excellent session. I think these, all these speakers, uh, the, the talks were really well uh, set and the panel's great. But I have a question that should go across all of you that I kept popping up during all the talks. Uh, stress was mentioned. Um, what exactly do you consider stress? How do you define stress? Is it my electric bill that just went up or my gas bill right now in the middle of Minnesota winter? Or is it more of a chronic condition where you're under a lot of pressure at work? And what about how that interplays then with all of us working moms and how we are stressed from our day-to-day -day jobs while we're pregnant? And how is that having an impact? Should we be considering shortening our work days, maybe the last trimester? What kinds of things, uh, where do people come in here on this as to how do we define this and how is it being looked at? I think it's um, really important not to blame the mother. <laughs> uh, th these models of uh, stress, so you're, you're assuming that the infant is stressed through some sort of um, behavior of the mother. And, and so uh, we have used um, studies of um, maternal reported stress, like per, uh, perceived social stress, uh, maternal uh, reported uh, depressive symptoms. As a gross indicator of some kind of um, a mother who's upset, um, rather than you know identifying that uh, you know, uh, these are the effects of clinical depression, et cetera, et cetera. In the uh, I, I didn't show these data, but in the child cohort and other kinds of pregnancy cohorts, when these uh, questionnaires are repeatedly administered to women, you can um, develop trajectories. Uh, so it's not yes or no, it's uh, is it the, the woman um, who has um, high stress during pregnancy postnatally, some women have high stress during pregnancy which, which drops, and then the other way around. And so there are typically five different um, um, trajectories. I think those trajectories will give us a little bit more insight, and when you start to correlate those trajectories, which we have with a paper under review, with uh, uh, work conditions. Um, uh, employed, unemployed, uh, we've created a, a measure of work exha um, exhaustion, really uh, for the purpose of not uh, to provide additional information on the context um, and not say it's the mother who's depressed who's responsible for these low IgA levels in her infant. 
And the thing about stress is that there's a large inter-individual uh, uh, variation and what's stressful for one person may not be stressful for the other. So that's why these scales are in, and, and this type of more granular analysis is really important uh, in, 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 in delineated. And we're looking largely at biological measures as well as psychological measures of stress. So. Uh, you know, understanding the full spectrum, and also not under, not focusing on just susceptibility to stress, but also resilience. Some mothers who go out to work are much less stressed uh, because th they would be more stressed if they were at home. So understanding all of these factors is is, is, is very complex, um, but but also needs to be taken into account. And I just want to comment very quickly that uh, one of our findings is that if the mom is employed, um, then there is an inverse association with um, depressive symptoms. I go, yeah. Hi, Jessica Campbell from General Mills. Thank you for your presentations today. I always enjoy hearing about this area that certainly has exploded over the course of 10 plus years. Um, but at the same time, I also find I'm left with a lot of questions at the end because I'm always thinking about how to apply this research um, and the fact this research is not only like coming to fruition for us as in the scientific field, but also carrying forward into the consumer area as well. And I know, John, you commented on that. Um, and so I wonder from the panel, like how, I mean, how far away do you think we are from making solid science-based dietary recommendations in this area? As scientists, we know we could always ask one more question and there's always something else that's related. Um, but if you were to put a, look into your crystal ball, how, how far away do you think we are from making some of these um, dietary recommendations in this space? And uh, what might those look like in the future? All right, so I'll start off. I think that um, if we're going to use the microbiome features as um, something to predict outcomes or to make recommendations on diet, I gave an example of the work by, done by Aaron Siegel uh, at the Weizmann Institute where they're using features, high complexity features of the microbiome to predict a personalized diet. And so I think that if they are successful in this, and they, you know, there, there's industry, a lot of industry in, interest in this, then that's a, a relatively near-term deliverable. Uh, so the, the microbiome as a biomarker for precision uh, diet. Um, alternatively, thinking about diet uh, as a either therapeutic or to prevent disease through the microbiome, I think that's a, a little bit. It's going to take a little bit longer. Uh, but I think that you can make transformative jumps forward. So even, uh, so I'm going to be biased because I, I showed you our data, you can engineer the composition of the human microbiota into a very different configuration using diet. So one could imagine that uh, that's not that far off, and that's a diet-dependent thing. So it depends on um, whether or not we, we do sort of take a systematic approach the way that we have always been doing it in the field, or there can be um, sort of transformative jumps forward. And you can never predict when those transformative jumps forward would actually come. Uh, but I am cautiously optimistic that within the next five years, we will be able to, using microbiome related type of, and then related type of research, be starting to see uh, 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 newer um, con concepts for products that ultimately uh, might be important for health and disease. My question. Oh. And I just want to give a plug for ILSI North America, our main focal area for the Gut Microbiome Committee, is to establish a framework for evaluating um, pre and probiotics and their relationship with diet and health. And I think having a defined framework would be very, very helpful. I think we've heard in the morning session some issues that. Um, impact all kinds of research in establishing causality of harm or benefit. And I think within the microbiome, it's even more complicated with the many methodologies and issues. Um, so please join us. Can I, can I add just one additional thing? Uh, I, I, I forgot. So um, there was a fabulous paper, and I can't remember off the top of my head who published this, but it's within the last six months in Nature. I think you folks um, who may not be aware of this should look it up. So in this study, um, uh, the investigators, and this was done in India, uh, used a prebiotic and a probiotic, I believe, a combination, um, and I think it was a, a form of lactobacillus, to prevent neonatal sepsis in India 
in neonates. And the effect was so large that they actually had to terminate the trial because, it's, uh, because of high level of efficacy. Uh, um, so we don't see this very often in medical management. But I actually uh, reviewed those numbers and they're actually quite stunning. So th this is uh, the real deal, a pretty convincing. A very, we're talking thousands of infants with a very large effect size using probiotics. Uh, and I think it's probably, the, the, at least in my mind, one of the strongest uh, levels of evidence for efficacy of probiotic in trying to prevent and or essentially they're preventing a disease process. It's gained a lot of attention, and I think um, that's a really good example of something that's actually happening right now. Josh Anthony, Campbell Soup Company. My, my question actually follows up a bit on the idea of uh, how do we use this information for, for recommendations. I, I, in some ways, I, I, well, first I'll say I really enjoyed how a lot of the talks looked at a more you know, systems-based approach and, and, and translation across multiple biomarkers or measures. I feel that sometimes because the field of, you know, of the microbiome is largely ignored, it's, sort of, it's coming back with a vengeance. And, at some t and sometimes it may be at the expense of looking at other measures or interactions of measures to help to inform those recommendations. I'll actually use the Seagal paper as, as one example. I, I think it's a great body of work, but I feel like it overemphasizes the relationship with blood glucose response. Right? And obviously, amino acid, blood glucose, insulin, lipid responses are all closely interrelated, which I think could help to strengthen the recommendations. And so just your thoughts in terms of, because this is you know, literally a complex ecosystem where we have to consider both the host response as well as you know, the microbiome response. And I, I, I think the one comment about how individual differences in metabolism as well as genetics can, can influence that. So thoughts on best practices for bringing it together because, you know, too much, you know, too much host without the microbiome is going, can be limiting. Too much microbiome without enough of the host could also be limiting in optimizing recommendations. So maybe um, Sharon Donovan. So I think, yeah. Um, I was going to say the same thing because I think that unless we know more about the host, that dabbling with the microbiome is, is not enough. And, I th and from my perspective, what's missing in most host-microbe interactions is information on the host. And I know, Gary, you presented data showing with the knockouts that nutrition is really important. And Justin Sonnenberg's also shown in many different types of mice that nutrition is really important. But humans are not mice. And your comment, John, about some women are more resilient than others. So where do you see, I just think we need to fit more human genetics and metabolism into these metadata, into these, these big models. So I think we're kind of asking the same question. No. Yeah, okay. yeah so, so that is precisely the reason uh, that we um, decided to assay secretory IgA in our infant uh, samples. We wanted a measure um, of the host um, in addition to a measure of, of microbes and, and what kind they are and what they're producing. So our next step is to start to combine um, this measure of, of microbiota and the host. Uh, and uh, it would require, um, as uh, uh, Gary mentioned, the, uh, the systems biology approach um, to look at the interactions um, with these, between these various components. But I think you're alluding to also genetics. Right? And I think that's uh, another dimension. So um, let me just uh, uh, develop that, that concept um, with a couple of comments, because I think it's fundamentally important that everybody sort of understands um, uh, how we in the field, that, and I'll speak for myself in this, think about this. So I showed you the plasma metabolome of vegans and omnivores, and they're very, very different from each other. You will notice that the top features that discriminate a vegan versus an omnivore are not from the microbiota. So I personally think that most of the effects of diet are a direct effect of diet on a host with some features of the microbiota that are probably important, but they're not the majority of the features, all right? So I am very often asked at a meeting, um, what type of diet should we eat so my microbiota makes me healthier? And I will tell people that I already can tell you what type of diet you should probably eat that's going to make you healthier and that is eat a plant-based diet and set away from red meat. And a lot of that doesn't have anything to do with the microbiome, all right? Uh, and, and that's another reason for why statins are one of the best-selling drugs around the world, because that directly affects the host. 
that doesn't have anything to do with the microbiome. So we, I myself, completely respect um, the, the space of the microbiome. There are some very interesting features that might give us additional opportunities, but the host is very important in all of this. But let me just say one other thing about trying to deconvolute um, the complexity of the information using high dimensional analysis and what's the value of that. <clears throat> so um, I used to always think about basic science research as from the wet bench into, the, into, the, into humans. That's what translation is. But growing, but in our group, we're doing a number of more and more studies where we begin in human biology. We collect a lot of biospecimens, we use our best computational techniques, and we look at associations. These associations are really interesting and good biomarkers for us and may have utility in and of themselves. On the other hand, these associations, we may actually not understand why these associations occur in human biology. But that's a great opportunity for me to bring that back into the wet bench laboratory to develop an animal model system uh, or develop a culture system to phenocopy that association. If I can phenocopy it at the wet bench laboratory, it probably tells me a little bit more about the biological mechanism. So it's this backwards and forward uh, way of doing research that I think is fundamentally important. And the reason to start with human biology is because you already know that that's relevant in human biology. That association always already exists. If you start with mice, sometimes you never really know whether or not that's relevant in human biology. So it's working backwards and forwards, I think, is one way of thinking about how you deal with complex information that can be valuable for hypothesis generation that can be tested. Uh, at the wet bench. We just published a paper in Science Translational Medicine about three months ago where we did exactly that. And I, I just want to make one more general comment, which is it also needs to be put in, in the context of evolutionary biology as well, in, in terms of that we can't forget that the microbes were there first and that we have evolved these mechanisms. And it's really this intricate host microbe interaction that's so important. Uh, and, uh, you know, and that's why we can't think of the microbiome as being something completely separate. It is part of a big puzzle, understanding how uh, diet and nutrition can influence host physiology. That's, that's great. And I, I know we've gone over, but everybody's so captive. I just want to make sure, is there any other comment that one of you would want to speak to or, or make? Can I make one final comment? comment? Because I have a big mouth here. All right. So my final comment is I think one of the strongest levels of evidence that the gut microbiota is involved in immune function is the development of atopic disease. Uh, and it's very, very strong evidence that growing in a, up in a sterilized environment puts you at risk for development of atopic disease. And it, it, it's, a, there, it's basically immune tolerance. If you're not exposed to enough antigens early on in life, you develop um, a hyperreactive immune system. An example, a very concrete example of that is our peanut allergies. My daughter is very allergic to peanuts. We knew very early on in life she was allergic to peanuts. We did exactly the wrong thing. We kept her away from peanuts, and now she's anaphylactoid. If we had exposure to low-level peanut antigens when she was growing up, she wouldn't have she would have a lower risk for anaphylactoid reactions. And this is all about immune tolerance. The microbiota is 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 full of antigens, and there's plenty of evidence now that house dust and Hutterites versus the Amish, which are genetically very similar to others, live in very different environments. There's a big difference in allergy development. So that's just a, a very powerful example of, of how microbes can shape mucosal immunity. And I think that is uh, I think probably one of the best examples out there. Um, so then in, in that regard, I do want to make a plug for uh, pet ownership. <laughs> <laughs> uh, owning a pet, um, especially a dog during pregnancy, so just to follow up on the 20 years of um, evidence showing the inverse association between uh, pet ownership and um, allergic um, atopic disease. Interestingly, uh, we published uh, a paper last year in terms of the pre and postnatal pet exposure, and the, the strongest associations were when the pet exposure occurred during pregnancy. Like, for example, in terms of reducing uh, microbes such as the streptococci in women who are positive for um, GBS. So some of, the, some of these interventions um, don't only need to be uh, diet-based, probably not a good thing to say at this kind of conference. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> well, thank you. Um, remember to fill out your your forms either here or on the application or um, the app in the in the um, cell phone. And thank you, thank you again for great sessions for everyone. Okay. Appreciate it.